Imagine kings addicted to poetry. Imagine a Middle East a lot more tolerant and inclusive 1,500 years ago. Imagine a kingdom where women were appreciated and respected. Our story begins in Marib, modern-day Yemen. The capital of the great kingdom of Sheba, cited in all major sacred books. A terrible disaster with the city's dam forces part of the royal family and part of the people to escape and find a new home. The caravan was led by Prince Jaffna ibn Admir, one of the four sons of the King of Sheba. It was a long journey, but they found solace in modern-day Syria, where a water spring named Ghassan made Prince Jaffna to establish a new kingdom, the Kingdom of Ghassan, becoming its first king in 220 CE. The royal family and the Ghassanid people adopted Christianity as their faith, a fact that remained untouched until today for the great majority of the Ghassanids, despite all the persecutions. The persecutions isn't from our days now. I mean, the persecution that began even during the Roman Empire, where Christians were persecuted everywhere in the Middle East and even in Rome. And this is why we have our martyrs and our saint that, I mean, it was about people willing to preach Christianity all over the Middle East and in the world. And when they were killed, you know, by, by, by that time, by the rulers, the governors, or the, the emperors. The kings of Ghassan established an alliance with the West, Roman and Byzantine empires, which gave the Ghassanids their cosmopolitan and progressive nature without losing their Arab roots. Maybe the most famous Ghassanid king of the first state was Al-Harith V, cited in Greek sources as Arethus, as a great general won several battles as a Byzantine ally against the Persians. That glory gave him such a degree of power that made the Byzantine Emperor Justinian I to bestow upon him the title of King of All Arabs, having the same imperial address of Basilius as Justinian himself that extended his control beyond the Ghassanids. One of the most amazing battles won by Al-Harith was the one known as the Day of Halima, when only 100 Ghassanid commandos destroyed an overwhelming numerous Persian army. I've always been a history buff, 
Uh, since a young age at school, history was definitely my favorite class. Years later, I've discovered that everything I've learned wasn't necessarily the truth, but a version, usually bias, of the facts. Learning the history of my own people, the Gassanids, I was amazed by how extremely relevant accounts could be left out of the mainstream history books. At the end of the 6th century, a man calling himself the Messenger of God conquered the city of Mecca and won several other battles. He decided then to communicate with all the main rulers of the world at the time, offering them to embrace the new faith. Muslim historians mention that Prophet Muhammad sent letters to all rulers in the region. The Byzantine Emperor, the Persian Emperor, the ruler of Egypt, the Negus of Ethiopia, and to our ancestor, King al Hadid ibn Abu Shmur, or Abu Shumar. And the latter said, if you embrace Islam, you can keep your kingdom. And the king was very upset because he was a very devoted Christian. But things started not uh, coming from the religion itself, but from some interpretation. And uh, as you know, the people who had to lead the, con the, the conquest, they were not all, always and every time a good believers. They had also their own dreams to uh, uh, somehow to expand, extend the religion, the Muslim religion, but also to take power, to take advantage. To uh, uh, it's becoming on also and especially a human human interest. They, they, they went to to the west, uh, to the Spain, to uh, south of France. From this side, they conquer. Uh, uh, Asia Minor, uh, Eastern Europe, and it's becoming an empire, an, an empire with uh, political intervention, political uh, purposes. Some Ghassanid princes sought refuge in Anatolia, in the Byzantine Empire. The Ghassanid princes rose among the highest Byzantine elite. In the 9th century, Emperor Nikephorus I sat on the purple throne, claiming to be a direct descendant of the Ghassanid sovereigns, evoking the name of King Jaffna, the first king of Ghassan. Almost one century later, we lost our kingdom in the region of today's Syria and Jordan, and we came to Lebanon. One of the leading principalities that existed in Lebanon, of course, it pre, it's pre-Islamic, and it comes from the Hadramaut. The original family comes from the Hadramaut, which is today in the Yemen, and migrated over the years and established themselves first in Damascus and became a leading principality. But over the years, because of the different uh, uh, interactions with uh, empires, whether it was the uh, Abbasids uh, or the Ottomans, they eventually settled down in the mountains of Lebanon in the Gizgarta region. Now, what's interesting about them, they were not the only ones, but they are one of the principal uh, groups uh, that essentially found refuge in the mountains of Lebanon. Now, let me go backtrack a little bit because I think most people will probably not know the details about the history of this country. Uh, Lebanon, uh, as a geographic entity is very tiny, less than 10,000 square kilometers, a little more than 10,000 square kilometers, but it is much bigger than its geographical size because of its mountainous regions. And throughout history, various leading families found refuge in certain areas. The Hassanids, for example, established in the Zgharta area, they were a principality, which means they were not under the control of one of the empires. They were relatively independent. And for a long period of time, they did not have to pay financial um, sums of money 
in order to secure their freedom. They could interact independently from the empires under which they lived until the 1700s, where in fact the Ottomans exercised absolute power uh, over most of Lebanon and had most of the leaders arrested, including several of the uh, Hassanid families, uh, expelled a number of them, discouraged others to stay in the country, which is why a number of them left to Europe and the Americas, uh, and eventually lost most of their holdings. What they did not lose, however, was the dream of re-establishing the principalities to come back and claim what rightfully is supposed to be theirs. Many people don't know the history of our family, even in Lebanon. Why? Because as Sir Winston Churchill wisely said, history is written by the victors. And by choosing to remain Christian and independent, we lost all of our lands, our kingdoms and principalities. According to the Marianite patriarch Estefan Duahi, reputed as one of the greatest Middle Eastern historians of the 17th century, and also being in a beautification process since 2008 by Pope Benedict XVI, one of the families to be a direct descendant of the kings of Ghassan were the Sheikhs El Shamor. The Sheikhs El Shamor, faithful to the royal Ghassanid law, remained Christians. They ruled two small sovereign principalities until the 18th century, over 1,500 years after King Jaffna founded the Kingdom of Gaza. The writings of the Patriarch Duai are divided into several sections, theological, liturgical, and the historical. The Ghassanids and the family El Chamor are cited by his beatitude Patriarch Stephen Duai in the book The History of Times. The book speaks of Ghassanids with long chapters. It's a lot to talk today because it's very long. As for the family of El Shamor, after the reign of the Patriarch Duai, this a large and generous family, which came from the leaders, continued to represent Zagata Zawir in the political scene. And they were good men and women in the region and they extracted the free water for the people and their name is still there for water project of the El Chamor family. The water, when uh, my father came from Nigeria and this was like in the year 1947, 48, the area lacked of, of water and uh, my father had some water. So when the, they came to him from the villages around Farhata and asking my father about how they can help, help them if he can find any way with the government, which he tried. And in fact, they, the government didn't do anything. So my father, he took the decision and he said, okay, fine, now if the government cannot do it, I will do it. And in fact, he, uh, he provided water for like something like 48 villages. And all, all was done from his own money, from his own effort. And uh, the, this, this water is still running till today. And people are still drinking of this water till today. Uh, although some of the houses they bought from the, from the government, which is funny to say that uh, with all these ha what's happening now and after the war, the water of the government is cut from time to time and it, it's not provided to the houses most of, uh, most of the time, in fact. While my father's water is running 24 hours, uh, all day, all, all year. So, yeah. And 
people still remember my father because of that. And it's nice, it's a nice, it's a nice feeling when, when you go to these villages and uh, although, I mean, this project has been done now for over 50 years, they still remind you that that's your father who is giving us the water, that the father who provided all the work for the, the, the uh, he made all the uh, underground to, 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 to bring all these, uh, you know, the pipes, the, you know, the whole, the whole, the whole nine yards. So that's the, that's the water. You're probably be shocked, but I honestly think that a title simply as a personal owner is absolutely useless in the 21st century. The reason why my family and I keep this tradition is because we believe uh, there is a contribution for the Middle East today. And in the whole Middle East, there is only one country where the president is Christian, uh, which is Lebanon, but while in other, in other countries, uh, the Christians, are, I am not sure if they have, uh, you know, uh, their, uh, all their uh, uh, rights as citizens, you know, in, in the countries where they live. Because we, we have seen, I mean, in many countries, they do not have uh, congressmen, they do not have uh, MPs, they do not have representatives. I mean, in, in all mean of, uh, of uh, government life. And I'm not talking about political power, but I'm talking about our duty. A prince has the duty of service to his people, no matter what. We might lose our privileges, but we didn't lose our duty. Look the history of my late cousin who lived in this palace. Uh, he felt that he had the obligation of helping his people, even no longer being in power. He could just have enjoyed his money, but no, he was committed to his position, to his duty of service to his people. At the end of his days, he had to go to, he had to do some dialysis like two to three times a week. And uh, when he knew that, in those days, the machines, you had like one or two machines in the big hospitals only. So he bought his own machine. And um, one day he was going to the American University to, to make his own dialysis. When a lady came to him, he, of course he didn't know her, and she came to him and she was begging to, uh, for help because her, she had an 18-year-old son here who needed dialysis. And the, the hospital, they wouldn't take him because she had no money to pay. So my, my, the, my father's reaction was, okay, fine, so put him on my machine. And um, he called the director of the hospital and said, okay, fine, this is my machine. Uh, you don't have to, he doesn't have to pay for it. So put him on it. And when you finish, you call me. So in fact, after the guy, this, the young, this young gentleman finished his uh, dialysis, my father went to his own. And uh, the first thing that he did after he finished, that he went up to the, uh, to Baabda, which is the presidential palace. And uh, the, the president of the Republic in those days, it was uh, Samir Bek Frenji, and he was a close friend of me. And my, my father told him the story, and he said, look, I mean, the, I would like to help. Now you are a president, and it's nicer if you can do it, otherwise you are going to force me to do it. And you have the Ministry of uh, uh, Health should take care of this problem. And dialysis should be done free in the hospitals. And he promised him that. And in fact, the second day he called him and he said, all right, we gave all the instructions and all these hospitals will, will have dialysis machines and it will be done free for, for the whole Lebanese. And it's, uh, it's rewarding. I mean, when you hear that your father could help in doing things like this, it's rewarding. The Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius may be considered one of the greatest rulers of all times. And he hired a servant to the sole task of walking behind him as he received the accolades from the citizenry. Even when the emperor was praised, the servant had been instructed to whisper in his ear, you're just a man. Even being the most powerful man on the planet, in his time, he was known as a kind and unpretentious person. This is the real kind of royal, the real kind of noble. 
the family is one of the oldest family in the, in the Arab world. The history of the family of the sheikhs El Shamor was recently collected by the Maronite priest father Agnatius Al Khuri with a book published in 1948 in which he spoke about the ruling of the sheikhs of Al Shamor of Al Ahura in addition to their transfer to the Zawi. They ruled the region of the Zawi and spread in several villages like Kfer Hatta, Erdad, Rashin, and Quito and their presence in Lebanon was due to their descent from King Jebela in al ayam al ghassani the last king of the Ghassanids. Uh, we were we established in Laura and uh, we were there for something like a thousand years or maybe a little bit less and uh, when we left Laura we went to the north which the uh, we call the Zawi and this is uh, uh, between between Tripoli and Ehdin. And we we established ourselves in Farhata and we stayed there since. In Lebanon, many people don't know, but you have uh, sheikhs that are royal sheikhs, like their counterparts in the Gulf, for example, and you have sheikhs that are like barons, like counts, dukes, people elevated to nobility by other princes, uh, in this case, loyal to the Ottomans. This is a tribal title and rulership it's a, it's a rulership title for a tribe. There are two different ways, either emolument given by an authority or, as I said at the beginning, a tribal uh, acceptance of that individual to carry the rulership, representing the sole authority of that particular tribe. In the religious te term, a sheikh is also someone who is the elder member of the family, someone that has earned his respect. But both the Abbasid and before them the Umayyad empires, and of course the Ottomans had a, vari a variation of it with the Pasha system that they brought in. The term Sheikh was used as an entitlement, as a title given to a particular individual in a family, recognizing that individual certain privileges that the other members of the family did not have. As I say, the Ottomans changes a little bit by bringing the term Pasha into the, but it's equivalent, more or less equivalent. Sheikh and Pasha are pretty much equivalent. A mister in the Ottoman area was an Effendi only. Uh, a Pasha was someone that was revered. He, he had certain privileges, just like a Sheikh had certain privileges. Now, in the Sheikhdoms of the Arab world, that is the governments of the Arab world, that are based on a particular tribal family. Sheikhdom or Sheikh has taken on the title of a ruler in certain ins instances. For example, in Kuwait, the ruler is known as Sheikh al sabah He is the only one that actually carries that title in the country. That doesn't mean that there are not other Sheikhs in Kuwait. There are lots of Sheikhs in Kuwait, but there is only one Sheikh so to speak, one ruler. Uh, those that had emoluments given to them from the Ottoman Empire kept the title of Sheikh. That's why today, for example, in Lebanon, you have the Al-Khazan family as one example that still uses the title of Sheikh. Uh, you have uh, the Harb family that still uses the title Sheikh. One very important thing is that even if we didn't descend from the Ghassanid kings, we'll still be a sovereign ruling house since we rule it in two autonomous regions of today's Lebanon for almost 500 years. In the Arab world, the successful ruling families, both Muslim and Christian, have been those that have actually managed to keep the family tight. The, fam the power was controlled by very few individuals, whereas in Europe, for centuries, you had internecine fights between different branches of families until such time when one family emerged victorious and imposed rule. After which, all of the succession followed a particular primogenitor system. In the Arab world, this, did not, this has not occurred until very recently. That's why you had lateral succession processes where not just sons, 
that cousins, uncles, nephews, a number of other outside parties could participate in rulership. Until very recently, in places like Bahrain, uh, Qatar, even in Saudi Arabia now, you have finally a primogeniture system that has been imposed. But elsewhere, you still have this very difficult process of lateral succession that is going to create problems uh, in Kuwait, perhaps in Oman, perhaps in the UAE, which has seven different families, and they have not just one problem, but they have seven problems, since there are seven ruling families uh, in the UAE. Now, let's remember that the Ottomans were relatively impartial in their use of violence against the Ghassanids and all the other communities as well, to the point that between 1914 and 1918, during World War I, half of the population of, Le of Lebanon, of Mount Lebanon, died in hunger. Half of the population of Lebanon, 200,000 Lebanese starved to death because the Ottomans used that process in order to rule over them. Now, the excuses that they have given historically is because they had to do this to provide food for the Ottoman armies that were protecting them against the British and against the French imperialists who were coming here to invade. But in reality, that was not the reason. There was a pressure uh, under, uh, with the, uh, from the Muslim to, Christian, to, to Islamize Christian. It was, uh, you know, uh, uh, a sea of blood. And for what? You know, uh, we have a uh, very good picture here in, uh, in, in our uh, culture. Uh, there, were, there was a fight between the wind and the ocean. Uh, the, uh, only the boat suffered from that. <laughs> the ocean is not suffering, the wind is not suffering, the boat is. The, the, the boat is we. we are the boat suffering from this clashing between the wind and, and the ocean. The real reason was in order to control all of the principalities, including the Hassanids. Unfortunately, most of them were forced to leave their land and found refuge elsewhere. According to the books of Jeji Zaydan, the Ghassanid king left the Arab region when he slapped a commoner and refused to accept to be slapped back by him. The family played an important role in Lebanon by liberating the region from bad people. Sheikh Youssef El Shamour had a long hand in these acts of war. Defeating the corrupt people in the region beyond the borders of Byblos. A number of judges persecuted them in the region until Ottoman authority imposed a kind of open war against the sheikhs El Shamur. Then most traveled to the Americas, like Nicaragua, Brazil, and Mexico. One of the most important family members is the former president of Nicaragua, who's my father's cousin, Violeta Chamorro, and her husband, Pedro Chamorro, who is considered one of the most important judges in Nicaragua. Brazil has several family members, especially in Sao Paulo. As for Lebanon, the last of the famous person from the family El Shimor, especially the political field and public affairs, was my uncle, Sheikh Antonius El Shimor. And now, after him, his son, Sheikh Kali El Shimor who entered the political field during the days of the Prime Minister Hariri, and he's still following his political activities. 
Even our family being Christian, we are related to the kings of Jordan and Morocco, to the last king of Saudi Arabia through his mother, also to several Saudi princes, to the Sultan of Oman, to the emirs of Abu Dhabi and Dubai, to the last Lebanese princes of the Shahab family, etc. The Christian sect of the family ruled until the 18th century in Lebanon, and uh, it was dethroned by the Ottomans. But even no longer ruling, many family members kept publicly using uh, the titles until today. Uh, the Muslim sect of the family ruled until the 1921, the Principality of Jabal Shamar, or Jabal Shumar, or Ha'il, in today's Saudi Arabia. So, until the 20th century. As for cultural activity, my late brother, Sheikh Nasif El Shimor, tended to collect ancient books, newspapers, and manuscripts since the 1960s. His house was a library in every sense of the word. Many intellectuals, such as Dr. Mohammed Qasem and Mr. Antoine Al-Kawal, the poet, writer, and artist, Mr. Mohsen Yamin, and so many different intellectuals. Even the former captain of the Bar Association, René Gantous, almost continuously frequented the Sheikh Nassif's office. He had a passion for helping all college students. Even the doctors in the Lebanese, Jesuit and American universities were sending their students to Sheikh Nassif to help them provide the necessary raw materials for their lectures. At the same time, they took the books from him without returning them. There are about 3,000 books or more, no longer to Sheikh Nassif's library, which are very valuable. He was a unique phenomenon in the sum of vigor, generosity, and culture. The love of giving without any compensation and the political ideology of tranquility. It was known that he loved a certain political figure in the region. It was Minister Frangi. He had a weakness towards him. Even though I tender to a different political position, but I found that he was right to many things with his political and distinct political and even his great consideration about all problems. He had no grudges on anyone. And even those who hated him, he reciprocated them with forgiveness and indulgence. He had this nobility in every sense of the word. He was very interested in collecting many things about the family from the sheikhs El Shemur. He had many manuscripts, some of which were received by the royal house. There are also many ancient manuscripts that are related to the dispute between the families of the sheikhs El Shemur and the sheikhs Al Dahir. And to the alliance with the Al Hassan family in Betraych to help them to fight the sheikhs El Shamor. This is all what I can say about Sheikh Nasif and the family El Shamor in Lebanon. Even Ghassan and Christianity being a synonym of rebellion and heresy to the Islamic powers, some Muslim dynasties have claimed a blood link with the Ghassanid dynasty. 
like the Rasul-led sultans who ruled part of modern-day Yemen and Saudi Arabia from 1229 until 1454 CE. The Rasulids descended from the eponymous Rasul, aka Muhammad ibn Harun al-Ghassani, or the Ghassanid in Arabic. The Mamluk Empire was one of the most powerful in the Arab world. The Burji dynasty also claimed to have had blood connections with the kings of Ghassan. The island of Rhodes is famous for its magnificent resorts, ruins, and for being occupied by the Hospitaller Knights of St. John of Jerusalem. The island was also ruled by Ghassanid sovereigns for over half a century. The precise date of the island control is not known, but the fact that Leo Gabalas, the Greek transliteration of Jabla, referring to the last king of Ghassan, was recognized as Caesar and master of Rhodes in 1203 CE is widely documented adding another imperial title to the Ghassanid dynasty. Although the Ghassanid kingdom enjoyed considerable wealth and power during the Byzantine rule, they also saw the beginning of their tarnished history and lies, especially at the hands of the Byzantine historians like Procopius, the only source of many accounts, Agathias, Menander, Evagrius. Theophilite Simocata gave them only a marginal role. Theophans calls them wild and rude invaders, although it's known that they were extremely sophisticated, versed in the fine arts, poetry, speaking several languages, and amazingly progressive, giving to the women a very prestigious role in society. All of the prejudice and its reflex on history books was totally debunked by archaeological findings like the Eusace inscription found in the late 20th century, which is considered to be the most important Arabic inscription of the 6th century and the second most important of all the pre-Islamic inscriptions. In the end, the Muslim historians never liked the Ghassanids because they were Christians. And the Western historians disliked them because they were Arabs. The general people uh, misunderstands the concept of royalty. The sovereign, rainy or not, is the ultimate servant. And one example I really like is the one from Princess Isabel of Brazil. Her father, Emperor Peter II, was one of the greatest sovereigns this whole world has ever had. His daughter, she was a, a toddler uh, back then, and she was very excited to see the crowd, you know, thousands and thousands of people. And then she asked the father, Papa, one day they all be mine? And then the emperor replied, No, darling, one day you will belong to them. Do you not see that God has granted you such a degree of power that you will observe every king trembling at your feet, for you are the sun, the kings are stars, and when the sun rises, no star will be seen.